All right, man. Um, well, I was just kind of reminiscing here on how we got connected. It's been, you know, it's been over a decade, man, if you can believe it. Uh, I think yeah. uh, Greg Waldorf, uh, one of my, you know, first angel investors and mentors for me, I think he connected us back in the day, like probably like 2011 or something. That's crazy, right? Yeah, it's, it's crazy. I have a pretty terrible biographical memory, but I do remember even the specific place where I took the call when you and I were connected. So, so yeah, it's over a decade ago. That's, that, that's uh, yeah, it's crazy. Um, well, well, listen, thanks for taking the time uh, to chat with us. Uh, I know you're, you're in Spain. Um, let's talk about, you know, a little bit about your, your experience. I mean, for the audience that doesn't, you know, doesn't know you, been building, uh, you know, building companies for a long time. You've sold a couple companies. Um, you know, you were born in Venezuela and you, you know, you started back in, uh, in college and your first business was a, an online calendar, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then you did a fast food chain, like you did like te- tequeños, like if I, if I recall, like the little cheese, delicious yeah. little Venez- Venezuelan cheese bread sticks. Um, and so when and why did you decide to become a founder? When do you take an interest in technology? Um, well, yeah, those, that's, that's an interesting question. They're, they're actually, I mean, they're deeply related um, kind of chronologically, but I think the, the reason is very different. I, I think uh, irrespective of technology, I think very early on, I had a deep suspicious that, uh, suspicious that I would be um, a terrible employee. Um, and I have been an employee elsewhere. I spent some time at Facebook and, and other places that, which, where I, you know, enjoy working and learn a ton and so forth. But I kind of knew that I was, um, that I wasn't cut up to be, <laughs> to be, to be a good, to be a good kind of company man. Um, I, I, how, I mean, I guess I knew that because I had a lot of discipline issues as, as in high school <laughs> and, and so forth. And so I kind of suspected that that wasn't going to work for me. Um, and I had, uh, both my parents were, you know, company people. They work, both work at the, um, Kind of, my, my mom worked at the kind of iron public company in Venezuela, and my dad at the kind of oil producing company. So I saw what it was like uh, to be a company man, and, and just generally thought I should try something else. Um, technology, I think, what happened is that well, my, my father, my dad is um, is um, you know, is one of the guys that were you know writing code in punch cards, you know, a long time ago. Uh, so he's, he's been in software for for forever in telecommunications. And, you know, I was kind of aware and it was interesting. And when the first uh, wave of the internet came along while I was in, in Venezuela, and I'm kind of dating myself and you, um, you know, th- that seemed like an interesting way in because I think what before that, if you thought about starting a company, it, it, it meant having a store, you know, having an import-export business, having a, a factory. And I didn't have money for any of that. Uh, but, you know, to write a, an, an app that... Um, that helped people do, you know, on the calendaring, um, that was cheaper. It was just like hours of code. It was, it was hard, but it, it was doable. So for me, it was more like, well, this I can do. I don't see a path, uh, path for me to owning a factory or being, or being, or having like a financial service institution or a bank, you know, a bank or, or, you know, have importing, you know, I don't know, tuna from whatever. I just, I just didn't see a path for any of that. That's very expensive. Um, this was, this, this was the path and it was close to, enough to me because I saw my dad working on this and I, I had a sufficiently, a, a sufficient idea on what it would take to get that, make it happen that, that just the path opened and I took it. That's amazing. We, we caught up recently and I, and it's thing that I'm going to kind of like, uh, I don't know if I, I'm not going to quote you exactly, but one, one thing I understood is, you know, you told me that you've decided to start building businesses that scale and are profitable and you're very deliberate about that. And the implication I understood was when you said that is you're kind of tired of bu- building businesses that had value, but were more powered by venture capital and were, you know, unprof- unprofitable by the time you sold them. So clearly the current market is now obsessing about unit economics, right? So do you think that the classic growth of, you know, growth at all costs and blitz scaling model, is that gone forever? Or are we just in one of the other new cycles that the world tends to repeat itself? And, you know, how do you think about this when you think about, you know, building companies uh, that don't depend on venture capital. Yeah, well, uh, th- there's 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 a couple of things to unpack there. The, I think the the main thing, the last thing you said is no. I don't think the blitz scaling, you know, grow fast thing is gone. I think to your point, I think it's cyclical. I think it would be very sad if it's if it's gone. And I think you know, 
and I think it will be the end of, you know, modern human history, right? I mean, a lot of the stuff has happened this way. You know, you throw the ship out of the sea and hope to find a whale, right? And good luck. And if, you know, I don't think there, I don't think there's a world where there's human progress, you know, progress without like taking outsized risk uh, in search for outsized returns. I think the, the world will be, up, you know, we'll go back to the middle age. Um, so I don't think that's going away. I do think that we're in a transition right now. That's one point, just to re- answer that. I think specifically to not my personality, I guess my personality personality included, but extending beyond beyond me, um, I do think that there are two types of entrepreneurs that, that can build massive, you know, massive, massive companies. I think it's almost in, 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 you know, orthogonal to the type of company you're trying to build. But I, I think there's a type of uh, entrepreneur that it's, um, the image I have, I have in my head is that they're very good at kicking the ball forward. Like if you're playing football, if you're playing soccer, you know, you're very fast. You kick the ball, you start running, to sort of overrun everyone else, hope to find the ball on the other side of the court and, and keep, keep playing with it. Um, and I mean that as a metaphor for, you know, spending ahead of growth, to drive growth, to take market share, you know, to dominate and that type of stuff. And and it's, it's kind of more high risk and, and more high reward. And maybe Uber is that image of this company, you know, just taking over the world and, and, and spending lots of money. The business is good, right? The economics are good. It's just like how you spend to grow. And I think there's people and I think there's various amazing companies that have been built that way. And, but I think there's another way of building companies, again, irrespective of what type of company, where you, where maybe, again, if it's still soccer, you're just passing the ball more. You're just touching back and forth and going back. And, and it's more like, okay, let me open one car at a time. Let me, let me figure out if, um, let me figure out if I can survive if things go wrong. Let me make sure that I don't die. Uh, and you can build massive things that way as well, irrespective of that. What I do think is that, you know, if you are of the second type, more like a, more of a kind of cockroach mentality, right? Which is like, I just, I just don't want to die. And I want to keep growing and growing and grow, build something big, but I need to not die. Then I think these times are much better for you, for your temperament. And I think if you're the type of guy who likes to throw the ball ahead and, you know, and, and, and overwhelm the market with growth and so forth, which again can, can work really well, this market is not so good for you. I'm, I'm more of the, of the, of the cockroach temperament. Um, and so I feel great <laughs> in this market, irrespective of what I'm building, right? It's just like, when people are like, oh, we have to manage the business tightly and, 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 and you know, really put a close eye on cost and make sure that you know, the economics work. And I, I just personally couldn't do it, do it any other way because the alternative generates an enormous amount of anxiety uh, for me. It, it doesn't matter what I'm trying to build. And so anyway, I think there's a temperamental thing where, yeah, I think it's better for people who are, who are more cautious in how you spend money and so forth which is somewhat independent to what you were saying as well, which is like, well, there are some businesses where you don't know how they're going to make a profit. You know, hopefully they should have some positive unit economics or otherwise you'll never make a profit. But, you know, you're willing to spend and lose money for a long, long time to build something massive. Um, and it's very dependent on venture money and very dependent on acquisition strategies uh, to, to be successful. There's another type of business where where you control your destiny because you're you know, you're making money from day one and you're, you have certainly really good, you know, very high margin unit economics and, and just generally a profitable business, which you can reinvest or, or cash out or so forth. Um, those are two different things. Um, and so to, to your comment on our, 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 on our conversation, how I'm thinking about it, I think what happened to me is that my brain kind of split. And so I, I'm either thinking, what is the craziest, most amazing thing that can be built? Um, and, and I think it's more, I'm doing more, more of that as an angel investor. And then there's like this type of stuff that I'm more likely to build these days. I can see a path to, uh, it makes money. It's kind of more straightforward how, how it makes money. And these are, these are different ways to build in those companies. But, but yeah. So you're, you're kind of enabling yourself to leverage that risky thinking and more like kind of just like home run thinking more on the, you know, the investing side. So you get leverage across many different companies and then your your business, you know, the business that you're building are more kind of cash flow oriented. And I guess you can also fund the the big bets, you know, the cash flows in your business. Is that kind of how you, you think about it? I mean, kind of. I mean, you and I also spoke about this in our personal conversation the other day. But um, I, I, I think you would get to the same conclusion if you think about it that way. Uh, I, I think, um, and, and if I'm doing kind of mental gymnastics and exercises, I do think about it that way. But like, the, the real way how I think about this stuff, like the emotional, the way I connect with all of this is that there's a ton of problems out in the world 
Uh, some I can add value and be useful. Many, 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 I'm completely useless. And so th- that's one thing. And the other thing is I have things that give me energy, things that I find fun. Uh, and so I end up, and I think you're doing the same thing with latitude and all your efforts, right? And we talked about this. It's like, well, how do I structure my little box, my little space in this world where I'm kind of doing what I want uh, with, in conjunction with what the market needs? Um, so that I can, so I can add value and it can, it can be profitable. And, and that, and if I'm very, if I try to be very honest about that effort, then that box looks, um, I mean, maybe not the, the box that you get, you know, it's not like uh, happy meal number three on McDonald's, right? It ends up being you know, something else. And I think, again, if you try to look at latitude and what you're trying to do, I think, one could say the same thing, right? You're like, well, you can see how Brian being Brian and what he likes to do and what he's good at and he's structuring something around him and the team that he's built uh, looks like this. <laughs> and and it's functional, right? It can make money, it can add value, it can grow, it has kind of flywheels that reinforce themselves. Uh, so it's more like that. It's more like, what am I competent? What gives me energy? What does the market need? And and then what whatever comes out of that, it can be weird. I don't I don't care. It can be split into it just has to be something that I feel competent and gives me energy that, that I think it's useful, right? I can pay for it. Uh it's more of that. It's more I just want to be happy and do good work and add value. And and, and I need to do it in a way that works for me. So uh, yeah. Awesome. I want to dig into some of your businesses in a, in a second, but before we do that, you mentioned adding value and you know, you inv- invest and advise early stage teams. Oftentimes they're they're pre-product, right? Really early. What's the most common advice you find yourself giving to those startups, you know, figuring out those early iterations of products and maybe what's the most common mistake that you see? Oh, I, I don't know. I don't know if I'm good enough or have uh, or systematic enough to have like good answers for that. I know so many people who are better than me at this, but, but for, I guess from my vantage point, I, I think I would say there are two extremes. Um, that are, one is very easy to identify, but emotionally very hard to manage. And the other, the other one is kind of the other way around. So the one extreme is it's just not working, right? Like most, most things don't work. And there's many reasons why many things don't work. Um, sometimes you see like a hole in the market. You know, there's Uber for, for people. So should it be something like that for cats? And, and maybe, you know what I mean? And, and maybe there is a, a hole for that in the market. Maybe there isn't. And it's, it's until you go and try it and talk to people, it's just, it's just hard to know. Um, and so, so sometimes it's just like good. There are good ideas that are bad businesses, right? That's just, uh, and, and it's, I would say the majority of good ideas are not really good businesses. And so I think that's just one reason. And that takes some time to, I think you, if you failed a ton, well, as I have, or are surrounded by other people that have failed, then it's, it's easier, a little bit easier, you know, to put the, just to, the ego gets a little bit smaller and the, and the, 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 the memory of pain gets a little bit more salient and you're like, ah, this is not working. But I think that's one, and that's kind of hard, but, you know, at least straightforward. The, the other one, which I think is harder, is you have a thing that works. Um, and you have an idea in your head for why it works. And it's different from the actual reason that works. And the customer cannot really articulate better than you why it's kind of working. And so you see this, it happen, this happens a lot in product, like in consumer facing products, where you have a thing that kind of works and, and you think these five things matter. And it's just really one. And you start iterating on these five things at the same time and until you find the real core of what makes this thing really special. Uh, it's just not, not going to go anywhere. That's hard, sometimes impossible. Uh, and, and that's hard because you, you have a very complete idea of the product that let you to build the thing the way it is. But really, people may just care about like a very small aspect of it. And it, it's just very hard to see uh, unless the c- customer is yelling at it, uh, just yelling at it, just pointing at it. And, and that doesn't always happen. But I think those are the two main reasons. And there's stuff like, I think, you know, teams not getting along and co-founders, you know, not getting along. It's such a typical common thing um, that happens a ton. But, but yeah. It's probably the biggest reason why things fail, actually, uh, yeah, if you take I, about I would, it from, from the numbers. Yeah, I would think so as well. You know, co-founders or early team members just not, not, getting, not getting along. And, and I think the, and the, the, and the reason is that why is that so common? Like why are co-founders, you know, uh, and, and I think a, a good deal is just expectations and communication, right? Uh, what you think this pro, what you guys think you're building it might not be exactly the same thing. And unless there's a ton of success, you have to make very calculated decisions. If the vision doesn't, doesn't, doesn't compile, 
then it doesn't doesn't work really well. I think the other reason why that happens is that I think this famous story by um by a, a you know U.S. general that survived you know I think the longest surviving um, you know prisoner of war in the Vietnam War, and they ask him why how, how did you do it? And he's like, well, most people thought Christmas Christmas come, you know, we were going to be liberated. Christmas would come, we wouldn't. People will kill themselves or just like stop trying. I just thought this is it for as long as it is, uh, and I'll make it work. And I think, you know, generally in startups and co-founders, you need both people or all three to have a similar mentality. And that's a very kind of hardcore mentality that not, it's not always easy to have. Man, expectations. It's amazing what happens when, you know, when you're, where your expectations are set, it becomes reality, whatever your expectations are. And so, yeah, I can see that the divergence of expectations amongst co-founders, what you're trying to aim for, like how big you want the company to be, how long you want to stick it out. Like those are all things that like, and it's sometimes it's hard to know, I guess, but the more you can explore that before you start a business, probably you're setting yourself up for success because there won't be any surprises because you've already kind of flushed all that stuff out. I think that's good advice for founders that are listening to this, that are talking with your your co-founders in the early days. And you're, you know, the more you can get on the same page about what you're building, why you're building it, and kind of what you expect out of it, um, I think that's something that will serve you. Yeah. Another thing that I, I've learned working at a big company for a while, when I was at Facebook, I was having a conversation with this guy, um, who's I guess very senior now, and I was talking to him and I was like, how, how do you become a successful product person, product manager in this company? And, he, and he, I remember him saying, if you think you've communicated how you think about stuff um, enough, you haven't. You have to do it more and more. It's so easy to say a thing and have someone else hear someone else, something else. And so just the practice of being explicit about what you expect, being explicit about what you're thinking, getting the reaction, and then modifying your language and your tone or whatever to make sure the thing you want to communicate gets communicated. Uh, it's really important. In a startup, you're just very busy, you know, very busy building and selling and writing code. So you don't get time to sit down and talk. And I think that's such an important thing is to make sure you talk enough that you, the expectations have leveled. It, communication matters, and it's just hard to make time for it. At a startup. Two things you'd mentioned. You'd mentioned, you know, Facebook a couple times and you sold the company uh, to both Google and Facebook. I think you stuck around for a couple of years. You know, what advice do you have for a founder that ends up getting swallowed by an enormous company? And how did you manage during those three years uh, at Facebook post acquisition, considering you're not a company, company guy, as you'd mentioned? <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, when we were doing the transaction, I was talking to the to just this amazing human that works at, at the you know M and A team and kind of corp dev team, which is you know, hard to find such good good people at, at that type of department, but just amazing people. And I, I remember, I, I just have this, you know, I had to tell him the truth how I felt about it. I'm like, I don't, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can be a good employee. I'm, I'm terrified. I've never really done this, and the few attempts I did at this, I hated it. And he's like, you know, you're not, you know, you're not the first company we acquired. Uh, you are not basically saying you're not that special, right? I mean, a lot of people <laughs> feel the same way. Some other people have managed. If you want to try, you, you can manage as well. So I, I think that's just one piece, right? I mean, it's, it's just those companies are, you know, if anyone else feels the same way, the, the way I feel, you know, we're not that special. And, and so it's, it's, a, it's a common thing. And the other thing is that, you know, as I, got, as I got older, you know, you get a little bit more humble and you're like, maybe... Maybe I can learn a thing or two from Facebook. <laughs> you know, I can learn, you know, a thousand things or two thousand things, right? But you come in so so cocky about being independent and so forth, and, and it was very humbling. But I did learn a ton. So at some point, I had this um, this um, this um, disposition. I was like, I'm I'm here to learn, and I should I should just kind of be humbled and 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 and, tr and try and learn uh, how, however much I can. And, and some of the things that you can learn at, at that corp in that corporate environment can be very useful for running a company. Going back to what I just said, big companies require really good, clear communication. Otherwise, it's very hard to steer the ship. Um, you run a small organization, you don't need to be, you know, you can just, you know, say the same thing 50 times and that's it. And you learn to be a better communicator at a large company. So I try to focus on that and and try and get better at it. I also got lucky because the acquisition was driven by a guy that I felt very, you know, um, very kin, very akin, very close to intellectually and emotionally and in personality. So I thought, well, you know, I think we'll, I think if I can work with him, I'll work with more people. Um, I guess the one thing, the one thing that is really hard, and then I think anyone joining a big company should know is, um, you know, when you're a small startup, uh, 
it's really all, all about output. You got to get stuff done. Just get it done. Um, it's very much about, you know, what are we getting done? Why are we getting it done? And just getting it done. Whether it's you, it's me, I don't care. Let's just get it done, get it done fast. There's no other way of learning. There's really nothing else to protect, right? You can make mistakes. You just you got nothing. So you, you got nothing, you have to get something. Um, so, so, so output management, get stuff out. And, and I think large companies are all about input management. You have a very big, big ship. It's hard to control. If you wanted to move in one direction, you have to have a lot of people coordinate work to move the ship in that direction. If some crazy person steers the ship too strongly, you can kind of capsize a, you know, a, aircraft carrier and you don't you don't want to do that and so a lot of it is uh input management and it's a completely different skill and by the way i used to i used to shit on it and like ah but you know what you end up finding these amazing uh managers who are outstanding at this and who make a craft out of it and and, and it's uh, very uh, fascinating to see but effectively what i mean by input management is you know you want to get x done but x influence it, you know affects your core metrics and maybe affects directly or indirectly five more organizations. So, and, and then you get to get approval for that and, and you need to get consensus for that. So you're like, okay, VP of Y, I'm going to do X. It's going to affect you in these ways, but I think it's good. I'm going to pay up in these other things. Are you okay with this? Yes. And you do the same thing with another team, but then you realize that the language that you're using is threatening. So you have to talk about it some other way, but say the same thing. And then somehow coalesce all of that and then go back to the to the, to the CEO, whoever, go like, we're doing this and everyone's okay with it. So it's a lot of, a lot of input management. Um, yeah, I, I would say one more thing. Uh, if you worked at product when I was there, you spent a lot of time at meetings with Mark. Um, it, is, it is a good thing to spend some time with someone who's like a thousand times better than you at everything you're doing. And even if it's not too much, just to see what an absolute beast you know, looks like. So you get a sense for like, well, I'm, I don't think I'm ever going to be this. But you know, it's good to have a, it's good to have a, a bar. You know, but especially if you have the kind of cockroach type mentality, I just don't want to die. And then you see this guy who's effectively, you know, truly winning at the game of you know company creation. Um, you learn a thing or two of what optimism and drive and focus and ambition looks like. And again, if you come from a small town in I don't know, somewhere in Latin America, and you haven't had the privilege of seeing that. It's, it's cool to see. So big companies also offer you that. Someone is running that. Someone build that. They're likely very good. I'm sure you can learn from them. Any now. anecdote you want to share about that? Uh, I can't come up with anything specific. He's just very smart, right? And, and it's a team of very smart, driven people, guys who can think 10 years out, guys that can make really ambitious bets, guys who... You know, don't settle for anything other than the best management team. And um, there's also luck. You know, g- good product at the right time, good timing. You know, it's not. You know, there's some, a bunch of brilliant people who don't have the position. But, but I, I do think that you know, there's a difference, right? There's a difference between you know building a Ferrari and building a Lada in Russia. You know, it's just it's just not the same car. Um, and, and, and the difference is just everything, right? It's not just how it looks. It's everything. Every every little screw, everything is thought differently. Um, you just, I guess, you see it, and you're like, "Oh, I see. I'm, I don't know what I'm doing." These guys are are hardcore. That, that idea of input versus output is really interesting, and I want to actually, um, you know, talk about you know being a good you know manager, particularly in this kind of remote world. And maybe a good segue for that would be, you know, you're operating a handful of different businesses, right? One of them is called Matilda Explorations. You connect remote engineers with full time opportunities in the Silicon Valley. It seems to me like remote, you know, work is kind of a polarizing topic. Uh, you talk to people and it's like, you know, they, they hate it. They love it. Do you think remote teams are a superior model than office-based teams? And what's your opinion of, of hybrid? Yeah. I don't know. I think it's, not, it's something not unlike uh, the conversation that we were having earlier about, earlier about what do you do for a living, Brian, and what I do for a living and why it looks the way it looks and, and, it comes down, I think, a ton. You know, you can rationalize a lot of this stuff and create a lot of mental models and reasons for for uh, pro and con. But it comes down a lot to temperament and what type of stuff do you like. Uh, 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 you know, the benefit. You know, I think, I think, I think the basics of remote work, remote manage, managing, are harder than the basics of in person managing, um, because the uh, the 
there is a very low cost to a marginal piece of communication on in person. I just go to your desk, tap on your shoulder. This thing you just said, Brian, I just didn't, could you repeat? And then I go back, get a yogurt in the micro kitchen, go back. I thought I got it. I'm so, I'm so sorry. Can you tell me again? You know what I mean? It's, 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 it's okay. You can get it done. You cannot be a great communicator, not be a great manager. Um, and kind of somewhat hobble along because there's like infinite uh, micro interactions, right? Um, if you're a shitty manager in a remote setting, I think you, you ruin the company. If nothing will get done. And so I do think there's a higher bar from like minimally acceptable managerial, you know, competence, whatever you want to call it. I do think, however, that if you are a great manager, a great remote manager, I think, you, I think the best managing that can happen will happen remote. And, and, and I think the reason is that, you know, to be a good remote uh, manager, you have to have a lot of, basically you have to run the organization somewhat async. I, I'm, 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 I, for one, I'm not a big fan of all this, like, we're remote, but let's all be together virtually. Now, I don't, I don't see that as a, as a thing. I, I see it as you really compress and, and the amount of times that you're in sync, doing phone calls or seeing each other in person, uh, and try to make it very high quality. And a lot of it happens async. So you're forced now to write documents and have people comment on documents. And, and, and you have to effectively take advantage of the setup. You have different time zones and so forth. And you have to, you have to make the best out of it. And the best out of it is just to write documentation. And to write documentation, you're forced to make your thinking clear so it can come out in words. And, you know, writing and words can be, you know, if you don't know, if you think you know what you're thinking, and then you sit down to write and it doesn't come out and you're like, I don't know how to write. No, really what happens is that you haven't thought about it clearly enough. So you have the specter, the, like the, the silhouette of an idea and you think you have an idea, but you don't have. And so it forces you to, to, to be clear in your mind. And then it forces you to be a clear communication communicator. And so what happens if you're good at that is that a lot of the BS of people management goes away. A lot of it is, I thought you said, you made me feel, you looked at me, you know, it, it's, it's all of that. Whereas if you're forced to think deeply about what you want from someone else and you have to write it and you give them time to think it through, right? Four hours to look at a document dispassionately and criticize you and find holes and ask questions and you have to respond to that. Generally, you know, that time up front that you paid deciding what to do, you get paid back in, you know, in, in, in ample, you know, am, amply by, by just getting done the thing you have to get done. So, you know, I think it's like temperamental for one. And I think it's each has their own benefits and, 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 and you know, and, and disadvantages. Um, the way I see it, right, is uh, if you're running an organization uh, async, you have to run the whole organization async. And so you have to change how you do in person. So if you have a hybrid organization, you have to rethink how you do in person, what the purpose of that is. Because if you're like some stuff happens async and sometimes happen, you know, word of mouth, tapping someone's shoulder, and you don't know where truth is and information, and that, that just goes to hell. So if you're going to do, you have to figure out, like it's less about remote and not remote. It's to figure out if it's like an a, a, a async organization or real-time organization. Um, you know, if you're going to do real-time organization, then in-person is much better, but you can make it work remote. If you're going to do an async, then remote is much better, uh, but you can do it in-person as well. And I've heard these stories, I'm sure you have too, of Amazon, where people are forced to write these documents and read them at the beginning of every meeting. That's effectively async in-person, right? And, and so I think it's more about async and, async and, and, and sync and then, and then how to adjust. Um, and then the other piece is temperament. Right. Some people thrive in person, charming, motivating, running the troops. They stay late, have pizza, drink beer. And some people are like, I just want to think deeply about what I'm going to do. And I want to be told very clearly what I should be doing. And, I, and, and I'm less good with like all the emotional dynamics of kind of, you know, office, office space. And so, so you set it up to where it makes you happier, I think. It's really interesting. You know, I feel like uh, I communicate a lot more when I'm in person with people and I'm, I'm, I'm more of a verbal communicator. So I've had to kind of adjust my style. I do actually like writing and I, and I agree with you that you need to be a good writer in order to, you know, to be able to be a re good remote manager probably because, you know, if you're doing it async and you're, you're trying to, you know, communicate and articulate ideas, you have to be very crisp and succinct, as you said, and very clear. And so it sounds like you think that that's probably a skill that you need to, to brush up on. Uh, and it's funny because we actually just uh, had a, a you know an onboarding session with like the new people that started. It literally came directly from that. 
And one of the one of the the persons on there, you know, mentioned uh, Bruno, a new guy that just joined our team. He says, "I feel like I have to really sharpen up my writing skills uh, at 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 Latitude because we're not seeing each other. We're not we're not you know all, all together." Um, so I think that's something. But how do you feel about building trust? Because trust is ultimately the thing that allows you to generate velocity. And I, and I say velocity specifically, not speed, because it's, you know, the vector and the direction, not only like how fast you go. Uh, how, do you, how do you build trust in an async way? Do you have to just overcompensate with like, we're doing company offsites every, you know, three, four months where it's like really focused on trust building. Um, so what, what suggestions do you have there in order to have that kind of deeper connection with people and be able to move quickly? Yeah, I think the way the way I experience it is, I think trust is a function of clarity for me. So if your if expectations are crystal clear of what needs to be built by when and, and and by whom and what good looks like and so forth, then either things happen, they don't happen, and you can debug it. And after a couple of debugging issues, you trust grows or or you know or, or goes down. What what I do feel again, this is very personal to how I experience what, what you're saying. So it's not a really direct answer to what you asked, but um, what I do think happens uh, where where in person meetings and people you know, getting people together from time to time matters a ton is, you know, so sometimes you have a list of things you want to work on, right? And you talk about number one, and you have them stack ranked. You're like, we have to do one, two, and three. And, and, and you talk about one, and you talk about two, and you talk about three. And you say one is more important than two, and two more important than three. Uh, and then for some reason, one is not getting done as fast or it's not as important. And then you're like, then either you can, again, be even a, a more dramatic communicator and go like, two and three are out of the, out of the table. <laughs> And we're only going to do one and then end of story. But that's not, not always easy. Sometimes you have to do more than one stuff. And so, and so sometimes like the sense of urgency or importance of things are very are harder to communicate, I think, in writing. And I think I find that a meeting in person is really good at saying this stuff here, I think, is mission critical. And I think it should, not, it should keep us awake. And, and this is why. And that, that's, even if you write it, I think it, things that appeal to emotions. Uh, which is generally things that appeal to a sense of urgency uh, are very hard to communicate. I think you're, it's, writing is really good to uh, uh, communicate importance, but not urgency because it's kind of more emotional. So I think you get people together to, go, to say that. The other thing that's emotional that is hard to communicate in writing is like celebrations and things like that, right? You're like, hooray, that's not really good. You know, you want to, you want to do something else. So, so it's, at least for me, it's more that, but I don't know. No, that makes a lot of, it makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, I mean, a celebration emoji is, doesn't really, doesn't really warrant the, uh, you know, closing a huge contract that's going to be transformative for the company, right? <laughs> like, like, There's nothing you can write. I mean, you can write something and it can help you when you want to get that person a hug and, and thank them and celebrate them and toast to them. It's just a little bit different. Yeah, yeah. T- Totally. You've mentioned that you've started a couple of companies in Silicon Valley and had, you know, distributed teams of engineers in Latin America and now with Matilda Explorations, you're doing the same for other companies. What are some best practices in terms of, uh, you know, recruiting teams and building building out really talented and diverse teams that, you know, where people are, you know, motivated and, you know, you're able to retain the, the top talent? What advice do you have for founders about, and I guess engineering is kind of the, you know, engineering and product is the area that you've specialized in. So what are your, what's your wisdom around that? I, I, I have some thoughts, but I would also like to hear your thoughts uh, on how you see like engineering teams in Latin America versus the U.S. Because I'm sure you have a. So I, I know you call me, but I, I would I would love I would love if you can spend a couple of minutes. I think I, I can learn from your perspective. But but from from the way I see it, it's there's a couple of things. Uh, so one is it is very hard to find really good talent that has the skills that you need and who's interested in what you're doing at the stage that you, you were doing it. That's why it's hard to recruit, right? And so the, the first thing that it's, um, that it's a big cost when you decide not to go remote is that you're deciding to just fish in a specific pond for, for under massive constraints. And so I think, so from my perspective, the first thing is um, you want to be region agnostic. Your goal is not to have someone in Guatemala versus someone in Sao Paulo. It doesn't, your goal is to find someone incredibly talented with the skills that you need, who cares about what you're building, at the stage that you're in with that group of people. Oh, that's so hard. You just want that. I think if you start adding more constraints, you're just like shooting yourself in the foot. Now, if you're building, you know, have friends and, and, and things that I'm involved where you need a lab 
right? You, you need some people with some drills, and you know, and okay, I understand that. But if you're just doing software, I, I think that's that's the number one thing, right? So that's one thing that is I think critical for remote. It's a it's a set it's a mindset. It's not about creating hubs. It's not about creating some hybrid thing. It's about finding the best possible talent uh, for your team, the best match, and that's really really hard. And so you shouldn't, you know, I think you should focus on that. That's enough. The second thing that I believe matters, uh, I was writing some notes to some of my investors, and you and I talked about this the other day, is time zones matter. You know, time zones matter a ton if you have kids, more so, right? If you have to, like, wake up at 6 or 7 to take the kids to school, and you have meetings at 2 or 3 a.m., it, 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 it's going to be hard. Um, and, so, and so time zones they allow for a lot of communication. You know, some businesses don't need it, but there's a, there's a time zone tax and you either pay it or don't pay it and you have to figure out how you think about it. That, of course, uh, gives uh, LATAM a super competitive advantage on the, on the U.S. market, which I think it's, it's a real thing. Um, so I think that's the second thing. I think the third thing is um, we're getting better at this, but you, you, the mental model a year or two, this started changing maybe a year or two prior to the pandemic due to uh, cost of living in SF and New York and so forth. But, you know, let's call it four or five years ago, the mental model was in-house, co-located, we build the core things. We send out the shit that we really don't care about that much. Fix that little bug. I don't care about the Android app, so go build it, that type of stuff. And, and, and some people are somewhere trapped along that line and that line is very unproductive and so you have to think about these guys as team members otherwise it's just not going to work um that means a high level of trust that means access to the github repository you know you have to give them the opportunity to make mistakes right when you start gating someone for a month before they can get full access to the github repository because you don't trust someone in colombia to be as trustworthy as someone in you know austin texas then you're already going to screw that up right and so you have to have a system that is resilient against these type of mistakes uh, no matter where they're made. And then if you find someone remote, you have to make them a full-time team member and, and, and give them access, right? Um, and I think the third thing is a compensation thing, right? Where there's like a changing ties in some sense. Like if you're coming from the US and you're paying someone that used to work at Banco do Brazil or, or whatever, Cemex in Mexico, and then you can pay less in the US and, and, and you know everyone's happier. Uh, and yet if this person who is in Mexico was working for Kavak or he was working for Quinto Andar or for Nubank, then they already kind of leveled up. And so I think there's something around navigating the, the marketplace for pricing uh, that it's a little bit kind of changing ties, but you just got to do the right thing to make it work. No, I mean, I think that the, the natural evolution is that probably, I mean, maybe salaries will like, you know, just kind of like merge more closely right i mean if if you're you know uh, uh, like it'll just they'll lift up probably and then there may be some pricing pressure on engineers in the us i don't know i haven't seen that happen yet i but i mean if you can find the talent so that's definitely something difficult to navigate but one thing i want to just you know kind of uh, highlight that i think something you said that i think i i i learned this i didn't learn this the hard way but i remember having unnecessary like frustration about this is that i would find some people that i think are really talented like they were really passionate about, you know, what we were building, but like the stage, like, you know, I lost some people like that I tried to hire to like big, you know, big companies, you know, that decided to go somewhere else. And there is like a DNA thing in terms of like digging in on some like really hard stuff and not, and having a lot of uncertainty and the, the discomfort that brings or the people that thrive in that, in that environment, right? People that there's people that you just throw a bunch of, you know, problems at and they just love it. And they're just like, they just like, you know, just embrace it. And, and, and so I think that, uh, I, I remember taking those things kind of personally. I'm like, if this person loves what we're doing, you know, and is so like motivated, they see the potential yet they decide to, you know, join this other big company. It's, you know, it's just a different, you know, so understanding and assessing the priorities. One exercise that I learned from, a former, you know, VP of engineering at, you know, in, in my company is that, and it helped me in hiring. And I use this framework when I decided who my investors were going to be. I, I have the, the candidate really just outline everything they care about. And then I have them stack rank what they care about. And then I, you know, ask them to assign like a multiple, you know, um, you know, if you care about autonomy and, you know, you know, X and Y and Z, and that it serves two functions. One, it creates like massive clarity for the, the candidate that you're trying to recruit because they can really start making a really uh, rational, you know, comparison of like how they should be making their decision. 
And then two, it gives you the advantage of understanding what they care about and it allows you to sell, sell through a little bit more on the benefits of joining your team because you understand what they value. And I think that's, you know, that's part of sales is really understanding where pe- what people care about and then, you know, not highlighting the things that they don't really give a shit about, right? So I think those are two quick reflections on like team building and, and hiring that I think is relevant, not just for product engineering, but probably for the, for the rest of the organization as well. Yeah, I mean, on Matilda, where we have, we, we see, you know, a lot of engineers, one kind of programmatic alert that we already have, it's just like built in our workflow is if someone is interviewing at a startup and at a big company, we're like, we stop everything and we're like, okay, let's talk about the differences. Just, in case, just to make it super explicit, if you care about autonomy and care about you know, end-to-end system ownership, and if you care about um, creativity, and if you care about being thrown into new things you've never done before, uh, uh, and, the, and, and if you're willing to endure the pain of seeing half of the customers disappear in one day and see the company pivot, and if you're an uncertainty about your future, you have this. If you want to maximize income, if you want stability, if you want, then these two places are not the same. It's like wanting to be a doctor or wanting to be a biologist. I mean, yes, loosely related, but no, not, not really, you know? Yeah, that's a big issue. No, I think that like less experienced people also like, they don't have the pattern recognition, right? Like of what, you know, if you haven't worked in these different environments before, you kind of, you make more of an emotional decision on, you know, where, where you want to be. And I think that's something that with time you kind of, you know, you gain the, the perspective and experience about what, you know, what, what it, what it looks like. Can I ask you a question? Um, Can I ask you a question on remote work? Yeah, go. Can I say what you, what you make of it? Yes. I have anecdotal evidence on this. I don't have hard data. Um, and I don't know, I don't know what the fact, what, what, what makes this so. so. So maybe you can tell me. Um, I, I have found that generally U.S.-based engineers working for U.S. companies churn more than Latin American-based engineers working for LATAM companies or working for U.S. companies. Um, while you were doing Quinto and Dad on all the investments you've done uh, with um, Latitude, does that ring true uh, as a statistics or, or not really? It's interesting. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to reflect and kind of try to think about it a little bit more. I mean, I think that like, you know, I think that the, I think, it, I, I think if you look at the, and we could actually dig into the data, right? I mean, this is available on LinkedIn. And actually, now that I think about it, you know, if you look at the big tech companies in the U.S., people aren't there for very long. Oftentimes, right? No. It's like, it, 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 so I, I, I don't have like I'm probably more anecdotal as well, uh, rather than you know some. But if I think back to like my teams and how long people stuck around, you know, I think I, I think it was a relatively like before any M and A stuff and we mergers and stuff like that when we were just like in execution mode. I think we had a pretty like stable team at one point. And it, it lasted, a, you know, you know, the core team was pretty consistent. And if I think about, um, you know, other, I, I don't know. I, 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 I'm going to, I'm going to lean towards the direction that you're saying, and I'm going to make a, try to make a hypothesis about it. Um, and without like, you know, judging an entire region, I don't know. I feel like, um, there's like, there's a bit of it's a, it's it's kind of, it can be kind of risky to like jump just jump around because you end up working somewhere that you you know and maybe there's a slight more risk aversion um I don't know in Latin America I, I, this is me generalizing I have no data to back that up yeah and it's like when you're working at a really good company you know if you're working at, at Newbank and you're super happy because the culture is great and you're challenged you're working with smart people um and maybe that's not a good example because that's like singularly probably like one of the you know top places for engineers that they want to work uh in latin america but i don't know I, w- what's your hypothesis on that and wh- if, it sounds like you've seen anecdotes of that do, do you have any um any kind of uh kind of prediction on why, why that is or? My, my my feeling and again it's 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 a conjecture I, I don't know is that you know latin americans care deeply about relationships you know, the role of friends yeah. and family, it's a little bit different. And I think if you're working at a place where you have people you like and respect and they like you and they respect you, um, that means a ton. That means a great deal. I think loyalty, yeah, loyalty yeah. is something that is, it, it exists more, I think. Um, and I think people, 
probably take things more personally sometimes. Yeah. And maybe that's like how, how that's how it's manifested in a, um, in the opposite side of like you leaving and someone's like, I can't believe you left us. We're, we're, you know, when even in the case where it's like better for the individual, um, you know, but they, they stick around because they feel some kind of, you know, duty to, which I think is a great quality, uh, as long as you're not sacrificing too much personally. Um, because you know, you should probably, you know, you want to balance like what's good for yourself and, you know, and then what's, what your opportunities are. So I think that it's interesting. Have you seen that, um, you know, as that manifested itself as you, you know, cause you're, and you know, one thing that, you know, you're doing is you're, you're promoting more, you know, talent to be kind of exported to the U S um, which, you know, I think is overall positive because opportunities should go where, where opportunities exist. Uh, and people should go where opportunities exist. And so obviously that will increase the salaries. And uh, generally, I think that's a good thing because it'll give people different exposure, different work environments. It'll it'll create you know more kind of just je- broad understanding of how things operate in different places. So I think it's ultimately positive. Um, obviously, it's hard for those companies locally that are making money in Ray Ice yeah. and your income is in Ray Ice. And then all of a sudden, you're expected to compete with U.S. salaries. The way we've kind of taken a stance on this so far is that, you know, we, we we probably want to be paying really well for Latin American standards and we're not, we can't p- compete with a top tech company. Um, and then we, you know, we can layer in equity so that, you know, because wealth is built through equity versus salary, but it's a, t- it's a challenging thing. So how do you, you know, you've, you've written that, you know, that there's this movement where, you know, you've got a more flexible and global labor market. It, and so that's, you know, that's, that's going to be more equitable, equitable and sustainable market economy. And ultimately this could lead to, you know, talent learning best practices and, and, you know, disseminating that locally, which maybe they'll start companies. Maybe, maybe you can kind of close this out with your perspective on that. Cause you're, you're thinking about it more than I am. Uh, yeah. I think there's two pieces, uh, two pieces to it from, from my perspective. One is kind of the, the, what, what the company Matilda Exploration thinks, right? So the comp- Matilda has a customer. And it's not the companies, it's the engineers. That's the customer. And so we just want to do right by the customer. Um, that's it, right? Uh, if we help someone uh, work with people that are energizing and they can lift them, lift them up uh, professionally and financially, not only them, but their family and their surroundings, then, then we're, we're, we feel great. And that's, that's our job and that's what we do. We cannot solve all problems and we want company, we can solve that one and we're solving it slowly and, and, and steadily. So, so that's kind of the end of it, right? Which is, we're just trying to do one good thing. That's a good thing. End of story. Now, from a macro standpoint, right? If you think about the nations and what happens to Brazil and what happened to the startup, the startup ecosystem and so forth, it's exactly what you're saying, which is, um, how much of Nubank and Bitso and Quintondar and, has benefit from the investors, the team members that you can pull from somewhere else that have seen something else. In the U.S., this talent gets recycled. You know, I don't think you could have built Google without Yahoo and SGI, you know, talent, and you couldn't have built Sun without, you know, HP talent. You couldn't have built Facebook without Google talent and Uber without Facebook. You just cannot, it's at some point, you, you, you need best practices if you want to move fast. Um, that needs to be bootstrapped in LATAM. Now, it's happening. There's a couple of companies that are truly world-class, and we're going to get more, and hopefully you guys will help do a ton of this. Uh, but but the, the region benefits from this, right? Uh, and I think at a very macro standpoint, not just in the co- company creation and best practice, at a macro standpoint, you know, uh, you know rich countries are, uh, are rich because they're capital-rich and capital can move freely across the world. If you're a banker in New York and you like a business in Brazil, you go, you buy, yeah, some paperwork, whatnot, you can get it done. And so your capital can go wherever it can be best served. And the city of the New York is better for it. You know, you live there, you may donate to the opera, build, buy a better apartment, whatever it is that you're going to do. Uh, but the capital can go where the capital needs to go. And if you, so if you own capital, your capital benefits from globalization, effectively. And so nations that own capital benefit from it. If you competitive advantage is not capital, but it's labor, like maybe Brazil and certainly when Venezuela is a, it's a different case, but you know, most, most of Latin America, you actually don't get that advantage. You don't get to export the, the best thing you have, which is people. And, and so now you're locked in and your talent is making subpar uh, global market rates, which 
if they could make more, there will be more wealth in the country to, to, to spread around. And so to me, remote work is like a virtual bridge that we're building across nation states to make a more fair global economy. So, so to me, it's like, I, I just don't see how we would do it any other ways. Uh, but anyways, that's my take. <laughs> as, as, long as, as long as Facebook, Google, and Amazon don't just hire all the engineers. They won't. They won't. This has been the fear all <laughs> along. We, we've lost and seen engineers go to Google and Facebook and Uber. I'm so happy to have that option. If you're the type of guy who wants to build something really from scratch and you want to go to Google, you're going to the wrong place. You have to go to one of the latitude companies, yeah. one of the stuff that I'm doing, and, and then you'll build something from scratch. Whether it's our company in the US or it's a company in Latam, it, honestly, for that engineer, it may matter more or less. But you know, Facebook is like a thing for some people to do a specific you know, job. There's other jobs. I don't worry about them. There are new ones, but it's not because they're doing it. It's because, it, it's because we haven't communicated well the difference between working on a big company and a small company. That's more from people like you and me than, than on the engineers. <laughs> no, you're, you're, you're totally right. And I think that one thing that like I, this time is way more fun because I'm building a company and I'm so grateful that we actually have like impacts. We have a mission that's like exciting yeah. and we're like, you know, we're, we're, we're building something that's, you know, reducing friction for entrepreneurs. And so like this actually, you, people gravitate towards that because like you said, people care about what they're participating in and it feels good to, to make an impact. So uh, that, that's something that I've, I learned, you know, not that I don't like real estate classifieds, but it's kind of fucking boring compared to like, you know, building a startup ecosystem. So um, so anyways, well, this has been a great conversation. We're coming to an end here. Um, so thanks a lot for, uh, you know, sharing your ex expertise. You've been around a few cycles now. Um, you did kind of date yourself, but you also outed me in, in the process. Yes, so exactly. uh, now everyone knows that we're, 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 uh, we've been around a little bit, but I think that, uh, has taught us a lot of things and, and, you know, we've always kind of kept the beginner's mind. And so I think that came through in your, and also this chat that, uh, you know, we can always learn from other people. And so this is, uh, something I, I feel really lucky to have this podcast. I get to have conversation with people like you. That's awesome. Thanks for, thanks for making the time to chat. That was awesome. Let's, let's keep talking. Don't get lost. <laughs>